everybody. Welcome to another live stream on Hitchup Valley Podcast. And today I'm joined by Professor Amy Jill Levine. And today's topic is going to be based upon her introduction to the book titled The Historical Jesus in Context. It's great to have you back on Hitchup Valley Podcast, Professor Levine. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Thank you for joining me today. So can you tell us about the history of the quest of the historical Jesus? <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, well, we can backdate it as far as the gospel writers mm. themselves who were trying to figure out how do we tell this story uh, given different audiences at different times. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had very different perspectives, uh, John especially compared with the first three gospels, on what Jesus said, when he said it, how he said it, uh, the manner in which he taught, and so on. Uh, the quest itself begins primarily uh, in the 18th century with the rise of questions of enlightenment and the breakup of the monopoly of certain churches, uh, particularly in Western Europe. Uh, Samuel Raymaris began with some of the concerns, um, but he, he had the good sense to be dead before his stuff was published, which was actually published by Lessing, uh, where he actually questioned the historicity of some of the gospel material. And that was still, you know, in those early ages, in those early times, a bit of a problem. Uh, we went through what sometimes referred to as the old quest, where people were basically looking at the Gospels and figuring out, I like this and I don't like that. And the stuff that they liked, they determined was historical. And the stuff they didn't like, they determined was not historical. And then Albert Schweitzer, who's one of those people who makes everybody feel inadequate, you know, an organist and a medical doctor uh, and a major figure in biblical studies, uh, wrote the book called Quest of the Historical Jesus from Ray Mars, that, that original guy who died through Vreda. Uh, a fellow who basically pulled the plug on whether the Gospel of Mark can be considered eyewitness testimony or good historical stuff. And he concluded that most of the people who were writing biographies of Jesus in the 19th and very early 20th centuries were basically uh, looking into a mirror. Um, the sense is they're trying to look into the well of history and they're just getting their reflection back. Schweitzer then more or less stepped into the same uh, well or mirror himself by describing Jesus as an apocalyptic figure. I think it was actually right um, then we take some time out for a couple of world wars and people in the, you know, the twenties, they're still doing some historical Jesus material, but they're looking primarily not at the big picture, but at this particular healing narrative or that particular controversy story or this understanding of the crucifixion, take time out for world war two. Um, and then following that, particularly in the 1960s, under the influence of a fellow named Ernst Kiesemann, the idea that, well, we have to get back to the historical Jesus. We can't just do these little snippets, and it's not just a whole existential whatever. But there's got to be some real history here, because if there's no real history, then there's nothing to, to hold on to in terms of things like the Incarnation. Uh, so Kiesemann developed a series of methods or approaches by which he thought he could get back to the historical Jesus. And these are sometimes called the criteria of authenticity. There are two major ones, both of which are problematic. Um, one of them, often referred to as the criterion of multiple attestations, suggests that if Jesus said something or did something in two or more independent sources, then it's got a higher claim to historicity. Well, the problem here is we don't know if we've got independent sources or not. Uh, so for a while, uh, it was Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're, they're all interdependent, and then John's over here in left field. And so if it's something in Matthew, Mark, and Luke matches up with something in John, then it must have happened. Biblical scholars are increasingly thinking that John had as access to all three of the synoptic gospels, all three Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So no independent material there. Uh, so if we can't find independent sources, we can't get back to Jesus. Moreover, um, even independent sources are not necessarily um, historically credible. I mean, two people can witness a particular um, traffic accident or whatever, and they both may get it wrong. And the second criteria, which was more uh, disturbing to me, is sometimes called the criteria of dissimilarity or the criterion of embarrassment. And the basic model was if Jesus says something or did something in the Gospels, which would be uh, antithetical to first century Jewish practice or belief and not quite in line with what the church wanted to pro proclaim. In other words, if it just looks really weird, then Jesus must have done it or said it. And that doesn't quite work either. Uh, first of all, we don't have that much information about what was possible uh, in first century Jewish belief or practice because there's no like head Jew to tell Jews what to think. Uh, so basically what that criterion did is it took Jesus out of Judaism rather than situated him firmly within. Uh, and in terms of what the church would consider to be embarrassing, well, if they put it in the Gospels, they could have thought it was that embarrassing. Uh, 
So we wind up with different quests and we're now in like the, as opposed to Kazeman's new quest, people talk about the third quest, which locates Jesus within his Jewish environment. But then you start getting all sorts of different Jesuses. Um, Jesus, the zealot, Jesus, the Pharisee, Jesus, the Essene, Jesus, the peasant or whatever. So they don't agree. Uh, and today we're seeing the application of new and different methods, uh, which may or may not have some sort of payoff, uh, cross-cultural studies of shamanism, studies of how memory works and memory theory, uh, studies of neurobiology and how the brain works and how that might give you visions of something. Um, are we ever going to get back to the historical Jesus? Like, I don't know. Uh, but I think we've got a better idea uh, now than we did 20 years ago. And I'm pretty sure we had a better idea than we did back in, in the middle of the 19th century. That's pretty quick, but that's basically it. How do scholars, uh, how do scholars go about trying to place Jesus in a historical context? Um, well, it depends upon where you want to start. Um, so some sc scholars will start with a, a, an individual gospel tradition, like um, some of the healing narratives, and then conclude that Jesus was probably known as a healer and an exorcist. That sounds highly likely to me. Um, and in part, we can do that by noting that he's not the only healer and exorcist we have at the time. There are others actually mentioned in the Gospels and in the Book of Acts. And then we have healers and exorcists mentioned in by Josephus, our first century Jewish historian, uh, by early rabbinic documents. And there are healers and exorcists in Greco-Roman uh, literature as well. Uh, so you start with individual pieces and then you try to put them all together. And there are others who start with the broad frame and try to figure out what's the, the general framework into which we can put Jesus in a first century Jewish environment. For example, uh, apocalyptic thought or end of the world thought as catalogical thought or healings or debates with other Jews. You build the frame and then you try to figure out how many of the individual puzzle pieces you can put together. Um, so scholars have different ways of starting and different ways of stopping. Um, and we also engage with different people in terms of how we put this material together. So it is still the case that um, people who tend to be on the liberal end of New Testament studies uh, use as negative foils people who are on the more conservative end. So you start fighting with each other um, and there's religious stuff at stake in that. Um, or people who are interested in Jesus as a liberationist are more likely to read Marx um, or a Franz Fanon uh, and less likely to read, say, the Talmud. So in part, how we put Jesus together, how we understand him very much depends upon who our conversation partners are uh, and who we read, um, who influences us. For me personally, I try to read as broadly as possible, and I go out of my way to read people who's the, with, who, with whom I would disagree theologically, uh, because otherwise we wind up living in our own scholarly echo chambers, and I think that's unhelpful for scholarship. And how does the synoptic problem complicate historical Jesus studies? Well... Uh, yes. So the synoptic problem is, is the technical term for how the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, interrelate. It's clear they interrelate. They, they quote each other directly. Uh, they follow the same plot line, whereas the Gospel of John does not. Um, uh, so it, most biblical scholars think that Mark wrote first, and then Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source and then developed it. They looked at Mark and said, well, we need a nativity story. So they put in different Christmas stories. Now, oh, we need some resurrection appearances because the, the earliest manuscripts of Mark just end with a bunch of women fleeing from the empty tomb. So they throw in different resurrection appearances, quite different. Um, there are also cases where Matthew and Luke agree with each other over against Mark. Uh, and this is uh, some of the material that's most familiar to Christians today, like the Our Father prayer. There are different versions in Matthew and Luke, but it's clearly the same prayer. And none of this is in Mark. Um, some uh, some of the Beatitudes, like blessed are the poor, uh, poor in spirit, Matthew, blessed are you poor in Luke. So we have these, these connections between Luke and Matthew that, that aren't in Mark. And for a number of years, uh, and this goes back to the, the late 1800s as well, the idea was that Mark wrote, and then Matthew and Luke had access to this other source that we do not have, uh, which we today call Q. Um, and the reason we call it Q is because the German word for source is Kelle, Q-U-E-L-L-E. -E. You know, if, if the person who discovered this hypothetical source was living in England, then we would have called it the S source for source. 
The problem now is that the consensus that there is a Q, uh, that document which would have the material common to Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark, the consensus that there's a Q is breaking down substantially uh, through the splendid efforts of a fellow at Duke named Mark Goodacre. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a commentary on the Gospel of Luke with my friend Ben Witherington III, who's an evangelical Methodist. So that's the point of talking with people with whom you might not agree theologically. And the more I worked my way through Luke, the more I kept thinking, yeah, I think I think Luke has access to Matthew. So I've become a little bit of a Q skeptic. So the upshot is with the synoptic problem is New Testament scholars are not clear who used who or how. Um, was there a Q? Was there not a Q? Uh, did Mark write first, or could it be, as the early church thought, and this goes back to people like St. Augustine, could it be that Matthew actually wrote first, um, and then Luke copied Matthew, and Mark condensed both Matthew and Luke, because Mark is a shorter gospel? Um, I, I find that less likely, but there are arguments for it. So that even if we want to argue for Mark in priority, which strikes me as correct, uh, Mark and Priority developed in an ideological situation in Germany where the idea is, well, if we start with Mark, then we don't have to worry about like Catholic Protestant distinctions because we get up, we get rid of all that Mary stuff um, that we have in Matthew and especially that we have in Luke. Um, and we also get rid of all the very Jewish stuff, particularly in Matthew about, you know, not, not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away or your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. That's all, that's all Matthew. So if you make Mark first, Jesus looks a little less Jewish, and that kind of fit what was going on in 19th and early 20th century German thought as well. So even if we think we've got an objective reading, there's all this other stuff behind it that can sometimes compromise our objectivity. And because you talk a little bit about Josephus and, what, <laughs> and the testimony of Flavianum. Yeah, just, well, I wouldn't date him. I don't trust him. Um, so Josephus wrote a number of books, and by books we mean what can fit on a scroll. Uh, uh, and he has multiple volumes called The Antiquities of the Jews, or The Jewish Antiquities. Um, and in one of these books, um, he talks about Jesus. We typically call this passage, a very short passage, the Testimonium Flavianum. Well, testimon Testimonium is just testimony. Flavianum comes from the name of the Roman emperors, Vespasian, Titus, and later Domitian. They were like the Flavian household, like the British household as the house of Windsor. Um, uh, during the, the first revolt against Rome, Josephus, who was actually a general in the galley, uh, surrenders to Vespasian, who's, who's running the war at the time. And Vespasian eventually gets called back to Rome to be emperor. So his son Titus does the mop-up operation, including destroying the Jerusalem temple. Josephus goes back to Rome and he takes the household name of this general later Roman empire, so emperor, so hence testimony in Flavianum. And he talks about Jesus um, and he makes a Christian confession. In fact, he says he was the Messiah. Um, now, the, the problem here is that we have lots of stuff from Josephus, including his autobiography. So if you think that Augustine got there first with an autobiography, Josephus got there earlier. Um, and he never mentions anything about being a follower of Jesus or about Jesus being the Messiah. There's nothing like that. Um, we don't have any of the original copies of Josephus any more than we have original copies of the Gospels. Um, it, so Josephus is preserved primarily by the Christian church. So a number of people think that this Flavian testimony, um, Josephus probably said something about Jesus, that he was known as a healer, that he was crucified, um, and that he had followers who thought he came back from the dead, uh, but that he himself was not a Christian. And the Christian scribes copying this threw in a couple of other little tidbits. Oh, yes, he actually did believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Um, if you look at Arabic versions of the works of Josephus, the stuff about Jesus being the Messiah is not there. So I think Josephus is an external testimony to the fact that there was a fellow named Jesus. Uh, and that's supported in part because later on in Antiquities, Josephus talks about James, the brother of Jesus, who, who's actually lynched uh, during an interregnum when one Roman governor has just left and another one hasn't come in yet. Um, so Josephus knows a little bit about this whole Jesus thing going on in Jerusalem, but was he a believer? I, I don't think so. So here's the problem with ancient sources is who copied them to what end? Um, uh, did people, when people wrote something, did, could you even trust that the scribes who, who were taking down your dictation, assuming you're not writing yourself, are they going to get it right? And that's always going to be a problem. And how do, um, <clears throat> does your skepticism regarding Q, 
alter your views regarding the historical Jesus? Well, it had been the idea that if you had earlier sources, they would be more historically credible. So if Mark is earlier than Matthew and Luke, then Mark must be historically credible. Uh, and the fellow I mentioned before, uh, Wilhelm Vreda, said, well, Mark's no more credible than Matthew and Luke. Mark's, Mark's got his own agenda here, um, which I think Mark does. That doesn't mean he's not credible, but it means you have to sift through to figure out how much is coming from Mark, how much did Mark invent, how much did Mark get from the tradition. Um, you know, Mark never claims to be a direct follower of Jesus, and church tradition says Mark is a follower of Peter. Well, if so, boy, Peter comes off really badly in, in, in the, the second gospel. Um, so we would look at Mark and Q, and those would be the earlier texts, and those would be more legitimate. Um, there were a number of New Testament scholars, particularly in the 1980s, uh, that looked at Q and also the Gospel of Thomas, this non-canonical Coptic text, mostly sayings material, and Q was mostly sayings material, like Jesus said this, Jesus said that. I said, oh, that's the early stuff. And then, because scholars are remarkably creative, uh, they determined that not only there, not only was there a Q, but Q was actually composed in different layers. So one stream of scholarship suggested that the original layer was uh, Jesus sayings, wise sayings, and, uh, parables, and like socially subversive or edgy sayings. Um, and then Jesus dies. Uh, and then these people are preserving these Jesus sayings, or these kind of Jesus people, um, are going out proclaiming that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and they're not getting much traction among fellow Jews in the Galilee who are going, well, if he's the Messiah, how come Rome's still in the country, and how come my kids are still hungry, and how come the crops didn't come in? And, you know, wh why isn't this a, a time of, of peace and justice? Uh, and then some of the Q people suggested that, well, maybe all that apocalyptic stuff, you know, the woes against cities like Capernaum and Bethsaida, uh, the threatening people with uh, wailing of teeth in the outer darkness, that, that was all put in by leader followers of Jesus um, who felt rejected by these other people and said, well, if you don't believe us, then, then we're going to consign you to hell. And then they concluded that some of the narrative material in Q, in Q, um, like uh, in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 7, there's a story about a Roman centurion who's got a sick either son or enslaved person, and he asks Jesus to heal this person, um, and Jesus does. Well, that must be later. It's like these miracle stories get added in later. The upshot is we don't know. Um, so I, for a while, I was playing very happily in the Q sandbox, um, and I constructed uh, the role of women in the early Q community. So, and, and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, that's kind of bizarre. I have a hypothetical source that's now divided into hypothetical layers, and now I can talk about the women in this community. That's just weird. Um, moreover, and this, this stems from this idea of whether a text is a community or not, when I was in graduate school, which was back when Noah was on the ark, I mean, this is a very long time ago, um, we were taught that Matthew was writing to a, a Jewish Christian community. Matthew doesn't even use the word Christian. That Matthew is, is writing to a bunch of Jews who are followers of Jesus, telling them how much they should accept Gentiles. Um, and that Luke is writing to a bunch of poor people, telling them that the, there's good news that will be preached to them. And John is writing to a group of people who are have just been thrown out of the synagogue. And all this stuff now comes more or less crashing down. Uh, we know, historically speaking, that in the second and third century uh, churches, the followers of Jesus, Matthew was the most popular gospel. And we know that by citation from the church fathers, as well as manuscript copies. Um, and those Christians who are reading Matthew, they're not Jews, they're Gentiles. So here's the problem of presuming that a text is a community. A text is not a community. And I think it's highly likely that Matthew and Luke and John or whoever are writing to anybody who wants to read their stuff because they think their stuff is important. Um, and if Matthew and Luke did have access to Mark, which I think is the case, then they're probably especially writing to people who have Mark to say, hey, we can supplement this stuff. You know, you think you know the full story? Let me give you some more stuff here. Uh, the beginning of the Gospel of Luke very hoity-toity prologue, very fancy prologue, um, in which Luke announces, lots of people have attempted to write the story of Jesus before. I'm going to do it accurately and in order, um, which means if Luke had a copy of Mark or Luke had a copy of both Matthew and Mark, Luke is thinking, these are kind of schwach gospels. I can do better than that. Is there a methodological inconsistency in historical Jesus studies? And if so, has it improved recently? methodological inconsistency. Um, it's, 
I'm, I'm not sure it's a question of inconsistency. I, I think it's a question of what tools do you find to be most, most helpful? Um, if, if I were in the medical profession um, and I were trying to diagnose somebody who, who came to, to my office, um, I, I don't think that using this test versus that test um, is an inconsistent thing. It's you use whatever test you think is going to get you there. Right. Um, so there's there's no there's no single method by which we can get at the historical Jesus, but there are some that seem to work better than others. Um, I think reading the canonical gospels works better than than reading non-canonical stuff. I think the non-canonical stuff is later. I think, for example, I think the author of the Gospel of Thomas had access to the canonical gospels. I don't think it's a fourth gospel out there. Um, I find less helpful. Um, readings that uh, say, well, I know what it's like to be a peasant, so therefore I'm going to read this text as a peasant. Because we don't know what it's like to be a first century peasant, or even whether you can talk about peasantry in the first century, since in the first century people were not attached to the land the way European peasants would have been or Chinese peasants would have been. Um, I think the best way of proceeding is the burden of proof is on whoever wants to make the argument. If you want to make an argument that Jesus said something or did something, then make your argument and see if your argument passes academic muster. Um, in terms of saying Jesus did or did not do something, that's really hard because it's really hard to prove a negative. You can prove somebody did not do something. Uh, but here, sometimes working in linguistics can help. I mean, if we have a pun like in the Gospel of John, where Jesus talks to Nicodemus, and he says, unless you were born, the Greek term is anothen, uh, from above or anew, and Nicodemus translates it, you know, it's appropriate translation, but not in context, is again, hence born again Christian. Uh, well, that pun works really well in Greek, it just doesn't work in Aramaic. So you might think, oh, okay, well, maybe we've got something that Jesus did not say in so many words, uh, but John takes the pun and runs with it, because John loves to pun. So linguistics is helpful here. What methodology do you employ in reconstructing <laughs> the historical Jesus? I'm going to use anything I can throw at the text. Um, and I read a lot in questions of method and questions of historical method, uh, not just uh, historians of the Bible, but, you know, historians of medieval Europe, historians of early China. Uh, because I'm trying to get whatever purchase I can on whatever tools are out there. Um, and as people keep inventing new tools, I'm going to use them. And sometimes it turns out that, well, this doesn't work at all. And sometimes it's like, well, I can do this. Um, some of the early work, for example, in, in recovering women's history, um, and now more recently recovering the history of enslaved people, recovering the history of the disabled, um, I think sheds new light on what we've got in the New Testament. I mean, the more we know about slavery and antiquity, the better we can understand um, Jesus' parables, which feature enslaved people. So it, it, the, the whole quest thing doesn't end. We will continue to use new methods. We will continue to refine them in the same way that medical professionals will use new drugs and new surgical tools uh, to do what needs to be done. And some work better in some cases and others work better in other cases. There's no singular way of doing this. Dr. Andy, thank you for your super chat. How much probability would Dr. Levine attribute to an actual resurrection of Jesus? What happened after Jesus' death? Any theories? <laughs> um, well, so in, thank you for the question, Dr. Andy. I was, in, in my historical imagination, the rules of nature prevail. Um, so I'm, I'm not likely to think that somebody who was actually dead came back after four days, um, any more than I think that Jesus actually ascended, um, what I have at the end of the gospel of Luke or the beginning of the book of Acts, where he sort of goes up, you know, into the stratosphere or whatever, wherever. Um, uh, but I do not doubt that people claim to have seen him. Uh, you know, could I have caught it on a camera? I don't think so. Um, I find in talking with Christian audiences, the, the did it or miracles, like did or did they or did they not happen, uh, gets us nowhere. Um, because if you see the text through the eyes of faith, then you're going to claim, yes, this happened. And if, and if you have a different faith perspective or you don't have any faith perspective, you're probably going to think, no, this didn't happen. Uh, so to me, the more interesting question is, well, what did people do with this belief? I live in Nashville, and I have an occasion spotted Elvis Presley. Swear it was Elvis pumping gas at a Mapco. Uh, 
like, wow, that looks like Elvis. So the difference here is that seeing Elvis on my way to work at Vanderbilt did not change my life. I just went to Vanderbilt, got myself a cup of coffee at the faculty lounge and said, I saw Elvis today, in which some of my colleagues said, well, that's nice. So the difference with the Jesus followers is it actually changed their lives. Um, can a vision change your life? Absolutely. So I'm more interested in what their belief in resurrection did to them or for them than it, than it, uh, a did it happen or did it not happen. Um, if it did happen, terrific. But again, I wasn't there. Uh, historically speaking, as much as I understand what Jews, and of course there's no head Jew to tell Jews what to think, um, Jews had various views of the Messianic Age or the Messiah, but they all looked at the Messianic Age and the Messiah as a package deal. So to have a Messiah without a Messianic Age made no sense. Uh, the early followers of Jesus knew this, um, which is why we find in Paul's letters, particularly 1 Thessalonians, which is probably the earliest document in the New Testament, uh, the idea that Jesus is coming back really soon, right? The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will rise to meet him in the air, and then we live forever with the Christ. And like Paul's thinking next Tuesday, or maybe, you know, two weeks from Wednesday, it doesn't happen. Um, so we can see in the Gospels a, a sense of, okay, how do we grapple with this? Gee, he's not coming back right away. Um, Luke's ascension is a really good example of that. Um, so at the beginning of the book of Acts, Jesus hangs around for 40 days after his resurrection, um, and then he goes up. Uh, and the disciples uh, outside of Jerusalem are looking at Jesus going up. And then an angel comes in and says, you know, men of Galilee, why are you looking up? Go to Jerusalem. you got a job to do. In other words, stop focusing on the second coming and start focusing on building the church. That makes good sense. Arnold, thank you for your question. Dr. Levine, what do you think was Jesus' main historical goal or purpose? Yeah, I like that question. Um I think that he was trying to prepare his followers for the inbreaking of the kingdom of God or the messianic age or what some Jews would call the olam haba, the world to come, uh, by living as if they've got one foot in that kingdom already, um, which is why he can say to some of his potential followers, you know, sell all you have and give to the poor because the world is going to end. God's justice is about to break in. Um, and if you really think that, that the end of the world as we know it or what the end of the space time continuum if you really think that that's going to happen really soon, then you live differently than if you think you're going to be here for another 30, 40 years. You don't need to get married because you don't need to reproduce the next generation. Uh, you can leave your father and mother and, and set up this new fictive kinship group uh, where your mother and father, your, your mother and your brothers and sisters are all fellow followers of Jesus and not your natal family. Uh, you can somehow take that next step and not only be, uh, kind to your enemies, which which Jewish law mandates, but actually love them, which is a distinct contribution of Jesus. Um, and you live as if the kingdom of God is about to break in. I think that's in part what the Sermon on the Mount is doing. I don't, by the way, think Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. It's basically Jesus' greatest hits that Matthew collected, because uh, Matthew is a very good organizer. Uh, but it basically sets out what this agenda is. Be even more righteous than you think you can be. Be perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. Uh, talk about forgiving other people. Don't hold grudges. More than that, don't hold debts. Uh, Matthew, forgive us our debts. O Philemon, Matthew. Um, so be generous economically, extremely generous economically. Don't return violence with more violence, but figure out some way of maintaining your dignity. So how do you prepare people to live as if the kingdom of God really is about to break in? Um, and if everything you did really, really mattered, um, how best do you follow Torah? How best do you uh, live the way God would want you to live? I think that's a fabulous vision. Does archaeological work in the Lower Galilee help us at all to understand the historical Jesus? Oh, yeah. Um, and we're knowing more and more about that, uh, in part through the work of people like Eric Myers and Mark Chansey. So uh, what do we know about archaeology in Lower Galilee? Lots of chalk stone vessels, um, lots of Sabbath lamps, which means that people there are concerned about ritual purity and Sabbath observance. Not just Pharisees, but everybody. Uh, secondary burials in ossuary, so they're collecting bones of people, putting them in these boxes, um, and then entombing the box. Uh, and that may have something to do with may have something to do with belief in resurrection, but concerns for your ancestors and how the bodies are disposed. Um, 
if we think about purity uh, as a general practice rather than something that was distinct to Pharisees, then we can get a better sense on how Jews are reacting to Roman presence. Um, what do you do? And, it's, and here's where cross-cultural stuff can be really helpful. So if your country or your culture is just invaded by some other country with a different culture and you want to maintain your own identity, what do you do? Um, well, purity is a way that Jews could maintain their own identity despite Roman colonialism. That's really quite helpful. Uh, purity is uh, a system in which everybody can participate. Uh, you know, a high priest can be ritually impure because that's how you get little high priests because if you're a man and you ejaculate, you are impure. Uh, and a peasant um, or a day laborer can be in a state of ritual purity, which is how you get into the temple. Uh, lots of mikvah in Lower Galilee. Uh, a mikvah is a, rit a ritual bathing pool. And there are tons of them all over the place. So it looks like people are really concerned in Lower Galilee about maintaining their own culture, their own ethnic identity uh, over against what the Romans are doing. Uh, Galilee is run by, at the time of Jesus, Roman client king named Herod Antipas, who's building two relatively major cities, uh, Sepphoris and Tiberias. How do you hold on to your own identity despite this encroachment of internationalism? And Jesus is part of that system. So he's, he is part of how do you figure out how to be a Jew in light of local politics? What is important about the Son of Man and the Anakic Corpus regarding the historical Jesus? <laughs> Gosh. Um, well, the title Son of Man is itself a problem. Um, we worry about translation. Uh, the Greek is weos to anthropu. Um, so like anthropos, like anthropology, uh, son of uh, Weos' son, so like son of humanity might be a little bit better. Um, in the book of Daniel, there's a fellow uh, who's identified as one like a son of man or one like a, a child of humanity, uh, which sounds like uh, an, an angel who looks like a person. Uh, and that makes good sense. I'm going to angels who look like people uh, populating the scriptures of Israel. Judges 13 is a really good example uh, where the, the future mother of the judge Samson meets an angel in the field and she's going, whoa, he's, he's really impressive. Um, he looks like a human being, but just more impressively so. Uh, the title son of man or child of humanity uh, is used by the prophet Ezekiel frequently, where God says to Ezekiel, oh, like the vision of the valley of the dry bones, like, oh, son of man, can these bones live? And here, son of man means like you human being, you very not divine person. Uh, you know, can you figure out how great I am because I'm God? Um, it, we find it in the Psalms, uh, the famous Psalm, what is, it, to use the King James translation, is what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou cares for him? So son of man just means a human being. So uh, in First Enoch and the Enochic literature, Enoch gets associated with the son of man figure. It's no longer like a son of man. It is a son of man. It's a title, weos to anthropu, um, or whatever it is in Ethiopic. Um, and Enoch becomes this person, and this person is an eschatological judge, an end time final judgment figure. Okay, now I've got Jesus, who probably used son of man. The Aramaic would be Barnasha. Uh, Hebrew would be Ben Adam. Uh, so when Jesus calls himself son of man, I think he's actually asking people listening to him to make a choice. Are you just talking about yourself, like the German Mann or the English one, like one did really well on our SATs, something like that. Uh, just means I. Uh, foxes have holes and birds have their nests and the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. You just think about humanity, right? Because we have to build stuff. Um, we can't just rely on nature. We have to do certain architectural crafts. Um, or is he saying, I'm just a human being like the rest of you? Or is he saying, I'm an eschatological semi-divine redeemer, like is suggested by one like a son of man in the book of Daniel or is suggested in First Enoch. So if Jesus calls himself son of man, that's a question. Who, In effect, Jesus is saying, who do you think that I am? I, am I just another one of you all, just another human being, or am I some sort of redeemer figure? Son of Man title drops off pretty quickly. It, it, you get it in the Gospels. Paul doesn't use it because um, it doesn't mean anything in in Greek, per se, where the idea of Son of Man means like, what? Um, so the early church moved very quickly to Son of God, which did have a certain cachet, uh, particularly in the Roman world, where Roman emperors could be children of God, um, like Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar. Um, or Her Hercules or Perseus or Theseus or any of those other demigods.
Let's get to the next super chat. Dr. Andy again. Thank you for your super chat. Does John chapter 14, verse 6 ever make Dr. Levine feel uncertain concerning possible negative effects on hell and salvation? Do Jews tend to look down on Christians? <laughs> well, heaven knows, Dr. Andy, I can't speak for what Jews think about Christians. I certainly don't look down on Christians. Um, all texts have problematic passages. So if we're looking at John 14, I'm presuming we're talking about I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Um, so if that's what we're talking about, um, well, the first thing to do then would be to look at the gospel's uh, literary context. Um, so in John 14, it's part of the Last Supper discourses where Jesus talks for a number of chapters, quite repeating himself on a number of occasions. And he's saying, you know, I'm where I'm going, you can't go. And, you know, Thomas, like the doubting Thomas figure that we meet in John 20 again, says to him, well, show us the way. And Jesus responds, I am the way. Like, have you not been paying attention for the past 14 chapters? I'm also the truth and the life. Um, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So I think what's going on here, and this is not original to me um, in, in the Gospel of John, um, is that John, probably writing toward the end of the first century of the Common Era, like in the 90s, um, knows about these fellow followers of Jesus who think that what Jesus conveys to them is not faith but knowledge. The Greek would be gnosis, um, where we get words like agnostic, so gnosis. Um, and the idea is once you get the secret, this heavenly secret, like in mystery cults, then you can work out your own salvation. Uh, and you get a sense of that actually in the Gospel of Thomas, this non-canonical text and other Thomas-affiliated literature. So what Jesus is doing to this fellow named Thomas is for the Gospel of John saying to anybody who might be a follower of Thomas, who thinks that Jesus is going to reveal secret truths that will help you work out your own salvation, Jesus says, well, you can't work out your own salvation. You can only do it through me. And that means only by way of the cross. So is this an historical reminiscence? I don't think so. It could be. I don't know. Uh, but I think it's more likely that John has composed this scene in order to talk to people who are thinking of Jesus as this revealer of esoteric secrets, saying, no, no, no. And that's why when we get to John 20, it's Thomas who says, like, I'm not going to believe this um, unless I get an actual resurrection appearance. Like, I can put my fingers in the holes where the nails went in, and then boom, he gets a personal appearance, at which point Thomas says, my Lord and my God, because, you know, what else are you going to say under such circumstances? The Thomas people don't really think of like a physical resurrection because they're very flesh denying and the idea that Jesus would be sarks. That's the gospel of John. The word became flesh, right? Like hair follicles and, and zits and whatever. Um, and the Thomas people are thinking, no, 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 God is spirit and you want to get rid of the flesh. So the figure of the apostle Thomas in the gospel of John um, not only moves the narrative along and helps us with Christology, but I think also responds to some of these Gnostic type folks who are saying the important thing is flesh denying knowledge rather than flesh enlightening um, and, and in, in living because resurrection body, Jesus resurrected body beats, which means he's not Jesus, the friendly ghost. I mean, he's a real body. Um, you can also walk through walls, but um, it, I think what Thomas is doing is going against this now. So to go to Dr. Andy's questions, what did Jews do with this? Well, most of us haven't heard it. Um, second, when Christians do come up to us, and they do on occasion say, well, you know, don't you know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but by him? Um, most of us are like, really? Okay, fine. If you want to believe that, that's fine. We don't believe it. That's your problem. Um, and I think that's a greater problem for Christians who want to proclaim a merciful God um, and then find themselves in this, this uh, intellectual bind where people are being condemned for not believing what they can't believe. Um, that's really hard. So for my students who do have this particular belief, um, they got really worried about me. Like, AJ, what about your immortal soul? Which I was, I'm more worried about tomorrow than I am about eternity, because at least tomorrow I can do something about. Uh, and I'm not going to believe in something uh, under threat, because that just makes God a bully. You know, unless you believe this, you're damned. And that just doesn't work for me. Um, so I made up a story. Let's see if this works for you. Um, so after a very, very long and happy life, I die. I find myself at the pearly gates, which is cool because in my view, there are pearly gates, but they're wide open because I don't think heaven's a gated community. And standing there at the pearly gates is St. Peter. And you know he's Peter because he's got a little like rock insignia on his lapel. Uh, 
Um, and it's like, I'm thrilled because I have, I'm Bible scholar. I have questions like, you know, can you speak Greek? Can you read? Where did you wander off to in the middle of the book of Acts when you just kind of wander off at the text? Were you really crucified upside down? Because that's not in the New Testament. Who won the food fight between you and Paul and Antioch that we have in Galatians 2 and so on? Peter's like, look, lady, I'm on duty right now, but pick up your harp and your halo here, get your wings and your slippers at the next table, and then we'll talk after dinner. So I'm off to go find the Blessed Virgin. Meanwhile, there's a fellow in line behind me. It's I mean, because there's a line, there's always a line, but it's heaven, it moves quickly. Um, who in his who in his earthly life was a television evangelist. Um, and he has managed to find in the heavenly antechamber a copy of a, a copy of a red letter Bible where all the words of Jesus are written in red letters, King James Version. Uh, one of those leather-bound floppy Bibles that you can take into the pulpit and like flop. And he's got his text open to John 14. He's becoming apoplectic. And he's saying, Excuse me, wait. So I forced stayed away. Um, he says, all my life I have proclaimed the gospel, I brought people to baptism, I've informed it, the only way to salvation is through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because he says this right here in red letters, and now you're saying that this Jew, he points to me, is in heaven. I don't understand how this works. Peter says, oi, gewalt, wait here. And he comes back in a couple of minutes with a fellow who, okay, here's archaeology, he's maybe four, five, four, five, five, which is average height of Jewish men in Galilee in the first century, uh, olive complected, um, dark hair. Um, and, you know, and eyes that look like they're coming right through you. It's really charismatic personality. Uh, and then to take a cue from the Gospel of John, uh, he still has holes in his palms because it, you don't lose the, the scars that you, you had when you were on earth. I mean, according to the Gospel of John, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus still bears the wounds of the cross. Now I've got lots of questions for Jesus, like, can you read Greek? You know, can you read? But there's obviously not the time. Um, and Jesus says, what is it, my son? And the fellow, and give him credit for his convictions he's going for. He said, did you not say right here in red letters that you are the way, the truth, and the life range? And Jesus says, yeah, the Gospel of John does have me saying that, which is very carefully phrased. But if you flip back to the Gospel of Matthew that does come first in the canon, I make it clear in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, that it's not those who say, Lord, Lord, but those who do the will of the Father. It's like... Uh, giving food to people who are hungry and clothing people who are naked and visiting people in prison, which before COVID I was doing every week. Um, it, it seems to me, says Jesus, that my daughter AJ has done the best she can with the talents that she's been given. The fellow says that's works righteousness. You're saying she's earned her way into heaven. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Go back to the gospel of John where I make it very clear that I am the way, not you, and, and not your constipated sense of salvation or not your narrow sense of soteriology. I say she gets in, do you want to argue? So if the Christian, theologically speaking, wants to make Jesus the heavenly gatekeeper, the Jesus I know from history, the Jewish Jesus, is going to be infinitely more concerned about how I live my life uh, than the particulars of my theology. So I invented, I'm a historian, this is projecting forward, I'm not a prophet, but I think that particular story is both consistent with what the Gospel of John is saying and consistent with the historical Jesus in terms of what is, what is divine judgment to be based on. And throughout the New Testament, divine judgment is not based on your faith, it's based on what you do. Uh, as the Epistle of James puts it, uh, you know, uh, faith without works is dead. I think that's right. I hope Andy's happy. Did, did Jesus take over John's movement after John's death? Oh, I don't think so. Because um, John's followers continue to be John's followers. Um, when In the synoptic tradition, when John dies, um, his disciples come and, and they reclaim his body and they bury it. Um, which is Which adds all the more to the pathos of Jesus. Because at least according to Mark... Because in Mark, Jesus dies alone. The disciples, as Mark put it, have forsook him and fled. And the women are only there looking on at a distance. Um, there are some people who thought that John the Baptist was the Messiah. John the Baptist gives good play in Josephus, by the way. Josephus really likes John the Baptist. Um, there are people today called Mandians. Uh, and they believe that John the Baptist was the Messiah. And Jesus is this late comer upstart. So could some of the followers of John the Baptist join the Jesus movement? Sure. Um, and here our best example would be a fellow named Apollos, who shows up in the book of Acts and also in 1 Corinthians. But I think that John's followers remain John's followers, uh, just as Jesus' followers remain Jesus' followers. Did people move movements? Sure. Uh, uh, did Pharisees join the early Jesus movement? Yeah, they did. Like Paul, 
But did they give up being Pharisees? I don't think so. I think they're Pharisees who now have Pharisees plus, plus Messiah. John E., thank you for your super chat. Why did John the Baptist, Jesus, and Paul think that the end time was at hand? Right. Okay, good question. Uh, because they're Jews, and the idea was that if you have a Messiah, you have to have a Messianic age. So if Jesus is the Messiah, by definition, the end time has to be there because the Messianic age is the end time. The problem was Jesus didn't come back. And it wouldn't surprise me that a, a number of the early followers who convinced that he is the Messiah and he is about to bring about the Messianic age, you know, they waited a week, they waited two weeks, they waited two years. And I think a lot of them said, you know, this was a really good run and we really like the ethics and we really like the, this new family values and we love the peace and the justice parts, but no, he wasn't the Messiah. And then they just go back to being ordinary Jews as opposed to messianically inclined Jews. Or they may have followed a different Messiah because Jesus wasn't the only Messianic figure in the first century. And we know that from Josephus. So the problem is, how do you have a Messiah without a Messianic age? And the church develops the idea of the parousia, the second coming. Um, and other Jews are saying, wait a minute, we got nothing in the tradition that talks about a Messiah coming once and then a Messiah coming again. Why, you know, why do you need that? Well, the followers of Jesus needed that because the Messianic age did not come uh, in the sense of the end of the world, uh, peace on earth, justice, uh, general resurrection of the dead, uh, in gathering of Jews dispersed uh, into the diaspora back to the land of Israel and, and all those other messianic expectations. So traditional Judaism still talks about the coming of the Messiah and the church talks about the second coming and it looks kind of the same. There's a general resurrection of the dead. There's a final judgment. There's peace on earth. Satan is defeated. Death is defeated. You know, the only question is, <laughs> you could say to the Messiah when he comes, um, you know, were you here before? <laughs> and if the Messiah says yes, then all the Jews are going to go, oh, okay, wrong. And if the Messiah says no, the Christians are going to go, oops, okay, wrong. Um, my When I think about this, which I don't think about very much because I'm not really messianically inclined, um, is that when the Messiah comes, she will confuse everybody and then we'll stop worrying about who's right and who's wrong. The next super chat appears to be a bit off topic, so. I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. Dr. Andy, thank you again for another super chat. What does Dr. Levine think of the works of J.L. Wright, Why the Bible Began, and Francesca Servacopoulou, God and Anatomy? Are Jewish believers aware of Asherah, Bell, and that Abraham, Moses, and Noah are fictional? Um, I think that the first two authors have, have much of interest to contribute. Um, I think Wright's book is fascinating. I, I respell Bible in the, in the chat. Um, uh, and I think Francesca's work is fascinating as well. Although, although in uh, Francesca's work, I find to be a little bit overstated because it's, it's designed for popular consumption. So it's got to kind of gut your, gut your lines in there. Um, but I think they're both really quite interesting. Um, so I would recommend them both. Um, uh, are Jewish believers, well, then I have to what, I fuss about, I don't know what Jewish believers means. Does this mean Jews who believe in Judaism? Does it Jew mean Jews who believe in uh, 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 Jesus? Um, I'm, I'm presuming that Asherah, but spelled differently, is the mother goddess from antiquity. Um, so El and Asherah, the Canaanite mother goddess, Jews, no, generally we would not. Uh, because our tradition, which is the church, in effect, the church's Old Testament and the synagogue's Tanakh, says, no, 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 there's a singular God. And once you marry off God, then, then you don't have a singular God anymore. You've got God and Mrs. God. Um, did some Jews actually believe in a Mrs. God? Sure. Um, we know about that from 5th century texts uh, and 4th century texts, the so-called Elephantini papyri, uh, which which uh, were written in Egypt in the 400s um, by this, in effect, Jewish military colony. And they had God, whom they called Yahoo, and then they had a not Yahoo, who was kind of Mrs. Yahoo. Uh, but generally, Jews don't believe in a mother goddess, you know, except when they do. It was the, they had Canaanite God, um, so no. Um, uh, Abraham, Moses, and Noah are fictional. Some Jews think that they are, and some Jews think that they're not, in the same way that some Christians think that they are, and other Christians think that they're not. Again, there's no singular Jew think. Uh, and Jews on the more conservative side of things are going to take the Bible more literally, and Jews on the more liberal side of things are going to take the Bible more as parable or poetry um, or helpful stories, but are, but are not necessarily stories that are all fully grounded in history. 
I'm going to take this next super chat as the last one, and then we're going to close it out. Okay. Dr. Andy, thanks again for another one. Great story. Speaks from my from the bottom of my heart. From my thank you, body. Dr. Andy. That's great. You should have your own show. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, my dogs have just come up because this is the time that they normally go up. So if you hear puppies barking in the background, that's that's what's going on there. I don't think uh, and don't appreciate it when biblical scholars um, use their historical critical knowledge to bash Christian faith. I just don't think that's appropriate. And, and so when I try to do the history, um, I may say, I don't think Jesus said this, or you know, like, I don't think Moses said this, if there were a Moses. Uh, but that doesn't make the saying less valuable. So I don't think that Jesus actually talked about being born again, but that doesn't make the saying less valuable. And I think it's consistent with what Jesus did say, which is these alternative family values, that it's not your birth mother that's important, uh, but how you belong to this, what we might call a family of faith or this, this new fictive kinship group. So what I try to do is add, for those people who are Christian believers, I try to add to them, is you think Jesus is important, let me tell you more about his first century context. And that would go to your questions about things like, what do we know about life in Lower Galilee, you know, in the late 20s, early 30s? Um, what did Jews think about various things? And how can we put those different thoughts into that first century context? Did Jews call God Father or did Jesus invent it? Yes, Jews called God Father, Jesus didn't invent it. So I can help the Christian who's a believing Christian enrich that faith. I can hopefully, at least what I try to do, um, is remove some of the anti-Jewish stereotypes that have filtered over the past 2,000 years into Christian study. Uh, as we're coming up toward Holy Week, we're in Lent now, we're coming up toward Holy Week. So a lot of that, those passages are really quite awful. Um, and if you don't know the history, then you may well, after listening to the gospel being read in a church or in a Bible study, think, boy, those Jews are really awful. And, and that's not a good way of doing it. So I, if I can eliminate the anti-Semitism and I can enrich somebody's theology, without taking away belief in incarnation, resurrection. I mean, that sort of stuff you can't prove historically. You know that because it speaks to your heart, not because it speaks to your head. So I hope that makes sense. And thanks again for inviting me to be on your show. Well, thank you for joining me once again, I'm Professor Levine. I thank everybody else for watching the show. And I thank those who super chat their questions and I'll see everybody later. Thanks again. Okay, look forward to the next time. Same here. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.